Take your copy of God's Word, if you will, and go ahead and turn to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. Our world is convulsing in war. As you look across our domestic landscape, you will see political and you will see social conflict. Even in our denomination, you see some type of strife. All of these areas deserve our attention, and most agreeably, I think you would say, they deserve our prayers. But what I wanna talk to you today is not just about the conflict that's going on in these different areas. What I wanna address with you today is really the conflict and the battle that may be much more personal. Something that you are facing in your life right now. Maybe as the semester is grinding down, maybe this is a moment when the enemy is attacking in one of the most significant areas of your life. You know, I think to myself about the spiritual battle that we are in. And don't miss this, we are in a spiritual battle. Every one of us, it is not against other individuals that we see. The Bible says it's not against flesh and blood, but rather it is against principalities and powers. Paul would say it's against the darkness of this age. It's against the spiritual host of wickedness. And I'll tell you, as I remember back even to my seminary days here, as I would commute back and forth to Picayune, I would pastor on the North Shore, be here as a student. I remember these days when Satan would try to attack, he would attack me, he would attack my family, and he would even attack ministry itself. So today I wanna to talk to you about that. I wanna talk about how to respond. I wanna to talk to you about what he does, the enemy that is, and what we do. Nehemiah chapter four, I wanna dive right into the passage. And you remember the background. This is a moment where God has shown his favor. God has been working. God has been demonstrating that he is the sovereign one over all of the universe. He has brought together these individuals, particularly the cupbearer, and he has allowed them to restore the wall of Jerusalem, to bring once again protection to the city and also pride for the people. And in the midst of all the work, in the midst of all the construction, the enemy attacks. This is what it says in chapter four, verse one. But it so happened when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious, very indignant, and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, whatever they build, if even a fox goes upon it, he will break down their stone wall. Now skip if you will to verse seven. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah and Arabs the Ammonites, the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Verse 10, then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing and there's so much rubbish that we are not able to build. Again, the enemy attacks. God's doing something. The enemy attacks. By the way, that's the way the enemy seems to always work. When God is doing something, the enemy will attack. And he will use some of the same strategies over and over. Because this is what I've noted about history. The redemptive history of God's people is that the enemy always seemed to come against them when they were trying to do something for him. So let me say to you, if you're trying to do something for God, the enemy will attack you. If you come in here today and you say, well, the enemy hasn't bothered me in a while, it may be because you're not doing anything for the Lord. Or at least you're not doing anything worthwhile. Because what the enemy does, Satan himself, the, this enemy that's out there, he will attack. What will you do? What does he do? Look at the passage. He insults. He insults. 
He comes and he says, those feeble Jews. We're introduced to these individuals in particular, Sanballat and Tobiah, here in this passage. They are enemies of the Jewish people. They're surrounding the J Jerusalem itself, and they want to see the people of God fail. There's also a third one in chapter 2, verse 19, that we're introduced to. That is Geshem of the Arabs. So in chapter 2, verse 10, you see Sanballat and Tobiah introduced to you. Chapter 2, verse 19, Geshem, the Arab, introduced. They're kind of like this unholy trinity that comes against the people of God, and they insult the people of God. Chapter 2, verse 19 says that they laugh at them, they mock them. Isn't it amazing that if you are an individual that holds to the truth and the sufficiency of Scripture today in our culture, that you can be laughed at and mocked? That you can be insulted? Here you are in an academic setting, and yet there are so many in academia who would dismiss us as believers as simply being weak-minded that would hurl insults at us. You believe in the exclusive salvation through Jesus alone, Amen. and you will be insulted. You believe about what the Bible says about sexuality, you will be insulted. I believe it was a wise man some months ago that I heard speak that said, not only are they saying we as believers are intolerant, but now they're calling us evil. Isn't that what you said, Jamie? You were kind of wise back then when I heard you speak. He insults us. What you see in the scripture is that the enemy insults. What else does the enemy do? The enemy not only insults, the enemy will intimidate. He intimidates. As I was reading through this, just hearing the words that Sinbalat spoke before Samaria, it says, what are they gonna do? Do you really think they can do this? Tobiah, I love, well, what he says here as he tries to bring intimidation. He says, even if a fox goes upon the wall, it will break it down. Intimidation. I read to you verse seven, because verse seven talks about Sanballat, who is from Samaria, Tobiah, which is one of the Ammonites, the Arabs, that would be Geshem, and the Ashdodites. I kind of I looked at that verse and I realized that if you were to look at their location around Jerusalem, like Sanballat, the Bible says he's Sanballat of Haran or he's a Haranite. So Haran was like northwest of Jerusalem. So you have the Ammonites, Tobiah, east. You have the Arabs, Edom, Moab, to the southeast. And then it says the Ashdodites, which would be the old idea of the Philistines to the west. In other words, they were totally surrounded. The enemy likes to try to totally surround us to intimidate us. You may not know this by looking at me, but I can be easily intimidated. When I was teaching, for a level college up at Angola at our extension. I would go up there every Tuesday and I would teach for a couple hours and then what they would do is usually break and the guards would count everybody to make sure all my students were still there and they would feed them and then they would bring them back and I would teach one more hour there at the, at the uh, penitentiary. So I was sitting in there one day because during that break, they kind of allowed us just to kind of eat, you know, while they were counting and feeding them, they would allow us to eat. I was sitting in like a, like a little office area, it had bookshelves on either side, like this. And I looked up and I saw this guy coming in the door. I was the only one I thought in the office at the time. The guy's coming in the door and I'm sitting at the desk, I'm eating and he comes right up to me and he comes right to my desk. And he says, Professor Bridges. And I said, yes sir. He said, you know I had you last semester? I said, yeah, I remember you being in my class last semester. He said, you remember me? I said, I remember you. He said, do you know, do you know that I got a, like an elf in your class? 
I said, no, I don't remember that. <laughs> he said, man, I made an A on every class, and I got, a, I got an F in your class. I said, well, something must have been wrong, I promise. Because this guy was tall, like he was 5'10". You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Waylon, you know what I'm talking about. Like, he was tall, and he was, like, and he was over me, and he was like, he was like, he needed answers then. I said, well, I'm gonna look into it. And he said, no, I need to know now. And I could just feel that intimidation. Like finally, I heard laughing behind one of the bookshelves. And I said, Assistant Warden Stagg, is that you back there? And it was. They were trying to play a joke on me or so. The, the, the administration up at Angola at that time, they were messing with me. But there was intimidation. Listen, the enemy will try to intimidate us. He will come around us. He will surround us. And he's trying to intimidate God's people to this day. Listen to me. He not only insults and intimidates, he invents things. He comes up with things. It says in verse eight, they all conspire together. They get together and get a plan. Dr. Janine Bozeman used to say that negative people always seem to congregate together. They are critics coming together. The enemy joins together. They conspire to invent things. I don't have time this morning, but later on you can look at chapter six. And in chapter six, it'll show you where they will send letters. They will create rumors. You'll see where Sam Ballad in particular will say, Nehemiah, I'm telling everybody, you just want to be the king. That's all you want to be. They even have a false prophet that they hire in chapter six because they invent things. The enemy will invent. He'll come up with stuff. He'll try to instigate. He instigates confusion. He instigates discouragement. This is a psychological battle. Now, I don't know if Sanballat and Tobiah had taken a social media, but somehow they had brought discouragement to the people. It says, actually, that Judah itself, the tribe of Judah, the royal line in verse 10 says, the strength of the laborers is failing and there's so much rubbish. Because even those of us that think we are the strongest, when Satan instigates discouragement in our heart, it can have real impact. The enemy will instigate, and I'm telling you, the enemy, he himself will inflict as much pain as he can. Verse 11 says that their goal was to come into the midst and kill them. You remember what the New Testament says about the enemy's goal? Kill, steal, destroy. That's what he wants to do. So in these last seven minutes or so, how do you deal with that? How do you respond to that satanic attack. First of all, I'd say this, pray. Some of you look at me and say, just that? And I say to you, just that? Prayer. If you are in a spirit, some of you say, well, that sounds like a spiritual answer. It is a spiritual answer. If you are in a spiritual battle, you need a spiritual weapon. Verse four, verse five, tell us that Nehemiah prays out to God. Now, you might question his heart here, but listen to his humanness. Listen to his emotion. Nehemiah, as I studied this book just a few months ago, I realized that he was a person of prayer. I couldn't even get through the first chapter without seeing Nehemiah pray. Because Nehemiah prayed. It says in verse nine, nevertheless, we made our prayer. Pray, pray. I read this some time ago that said, the devil fears nothing from our prayerless studies, our prayerless work, our prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, he mocks our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. There's something about it where we get on our knees and we pray in this spiritual battle. We persevere. We pers persevere. Look at verse six. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. 
for the people had a mind to work. When the enemy attacks, you know what you do? You keep working. You persevere. You don't give in. You just keep on going. One of my heroes from a distance, one of my spiritual heroes that I've had through the years is a guy named Chuck Swindoll. And Chuck Swindoll wrote a commentary on Nehemiah some years ago, and it was entitled, Hand Me Another Brick. Hand me another brick. When the enemy has attacked and you have prayed, you keep persevering. And you just ask him, give me another brick so I can keep working. Hand me another brick. Help me to keep going. Some of you, you're in churches right now and things are bearing down on you and I understand. Keep going, don't give up. Don't give in. Keep persevering. Allow God to give you the strength that you need. Prepare yourself. Now, what I recognize about Nehemiah, even in that ninth verse, it says, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. He prayed, he kept working, he persevered, but he also prepared. You, you, this is one of those that you pray and you keep doing what God wants you to do and you prepare. It says that they prepared. Later on in verses 13 through 18, it'll talk about how he will take different groups and he will divide them out. And I love this picture, Dr. Strong, of how in, in some groups there's one that's carrying not only a weapon, but he's carrying the workload as well. And God calls us to pray and to be prepared. They're not mutually exclusive. So we prepare ourselves for what God is doing. What else do we do? We protect. We protect. So as I read down through here, it says that they prepare by setting the guards. And then it says that he takes families and he puts them together in certain places of the wall so that they can fight together. Why? Because you'll fight for your family. He knew what he was doing. And he put them around. They were spread out against the wall. All the way around the wall, they were spread out. So they devised this plan. The plan was, if the enemy attacks from this side, somebody needs to blow a trumpet. And it says in verse 20, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. In other words, if somebody's having an issue over here, everybody needs to rally there. You protect one another. You got each other's back. Why? Because we're part of the family. I think we believers need to hear a little more of that. Some of our churches need to hear a little more of that. Some of our denominations need to hear a little more of that. We're part of the family. And when somebody's being attacked on one side, there needs to be a trumpet that is blown and all of us rally to face the enemy together. May I say this to you? You are not alone. There were times when I would sit here on these pews, there were times I would sit in class, there were times when I would drive back across Pontchartrain and I would go to my church out in the middle of nowhere and I would pastor my people that I loved. But there were times in ministry that I felt alone. You are not alone. And if Satan is attacking you, you need to know that you can blow the trumpet and we can rally to you. Some of you today, you've got something going on in your marriage. You need to blow a trumpet. I'm telling you, blow it now. Some of you have some issues that you're facing, maybe even an addiction that you're facing. You're trying to get up. Listen, blow a trumpet and let us run to you. My friends, we need to rally to one another and protect one another. 
So what do we do when the enemy attacks? We pray. We persevere. We ourselves prepare and we protect one another. Because God has called us to presume. Presumption's a bad thing sometimes. Presumption can be a very difficult thing sometimes. But let me tell you what we ought to presume. Well, let me use the words of Nehemiah in verse 20. Our God will fight for us. One thing you can know as a believer is that God's gonna fight for you. You just presume it. Listen, you're not gonna fight the battle for the victory. You're gonna fight the battle from the victory of what God has done. You are going to say, our God will fight for us. Our God will. We are here in the shadow. We are here in the shadow of Easter itself. Just a couple of weeks removed. And what do we know about the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? Is that he came to face the enemy head on. He died on the cross. And through his resurrection, he demonstrated that he had power over everything, over the enemy itself. And the Bible says that he reigns until he places all things under his feet. Because our God will fight for us. If our God will give up his son for us, Paul says in Romans 8, that our God will go to any lengths for us. I don't know what's going on in your life, fellow trustee, student, professor. I don't know. But our God does. And he knows that even, no, no, scratch that. He knows especially God's people will be attacked. He knows that the enemy will bring some of these same strategies. But he also knows that if we rely upon him and depend upon him, that our God fights for us. My friends today, I pray that we would face the enemy, that we would blow the trumpet if we need to to get some reinforcements, but we allow God to fight for us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your message. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, I just pray right now for those that are in this place that need to know that they're not alone. I pray for those in here that are just about to give up, that you would give them courage and strength to persevere. Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, we know that our God fights for us. In Jesus' name.